You're watching FJTN, the Federal Judicial Television Network. Good afternoon, U.S. Court of Appeals. How might I help you? Appellate case opening is, for the clerk's office, probably the most important part of the case, or at least among them, because of the quantity of information entered into the case at that point and the need at that point to set the case on the right track so that it moves through the court as it should. One of the biggest challenges for any case manager to face is the frequent changes that we have either with the rules or in inter our internal operating procedures. Um, they tend to be very frequent and it's hard to keep up with them when you're dealing with so many cases at a time. Probably the most effective practice for me is that I have to, to be, be very familiar with the district courts and the docket sheets. I have to be very familiar with how parties are entered so that when I make any type of search for parties, I can make it in a variety of ways so that I can be sure that I get uh, a hit, as we call it, on that party. I face many challenges. Probably the greatest one is um, assisting the pro se litigants. As pro se's, they do not have the knowledge that the lawyers may have and they don't have access to the rules that the lawyers have. So I, we have to do a lot more hand holding for them and guiding them through the appellate process. The opening of an appellate uh, a case at an appellate court is, is, a, is a critical stage of the process. There are a number of important decisions that have to be made. Case managers need to be uh, on their toes and very sensitive to documents that they receive when a case is open. Appellate case opening is a serious business. Hello everybody, I'm Bob Fagan, a senior training specialist at the Federal Judicial Center and I'd like to welcome you to today's broadcast on appellate case opening. Today we're going to look at some of the processes used and some of the challenges that appellate court staff face when a case is first open, as well as some of the effective practices that individual appellate courts have developed in order to meet those challenges. Through discussions with panelists both here in the studio as well as through push-to-talk sites throughout the country, the courts will be describing some of the processes and some of the effective practices, practices they've developed that works for them. As you saw in the opening clip, the challenges are numerous. So we've got quite a bit to talk about in the next hour and a half. So many subjects, so little time. We want to encourage you to participate. We want you to ask questions and share your thoughts with our panelists. We built in time for discussion throughout the program. And you can do this by either push to talk or by sending us a fax. Our toll-free fax number will appear on the screen throughout the broadcast. Also, feel free to use the form that was uh, on our participant uh, materials. And that's found on the FJC website on the DCN at jnet.fjc.dcn. And don't forget the participant guide if you haven't already downloaded downloaded it is also located at that same site. You may want to pay special notice to the five effective practices that were sent in by many of your colleagues and included as part of the guide. And now on to today's agenda. In our first panel, we'll be talking about case screening related challenges and that includes the role of case managers in that part of the process. Next we'll cover the issue of communication. That's how we communicate with the district or bankruptcy courts. How do you keep uh, attorneys as well as other court staff aware of changes in the FRAP rules, local rules and IOPs, and where do you go for additional information or clarifying information? Our third panel and discussion will focus on the important issue of quality control. With all the information required in case opening, what are the challenges and are there measures your circuit has taken? to ensure accuracy. Finally, our last panel is kind of a catch-all we're calling Other Case Opening Logistics. Among the topics here we'll be dealing with are pro se appellants, second or successive applications, and so forth. Finally, we'll end up with a little wrap-up at the end. Let's turn to our first discussion on case screening. In opening each discussion, we'll sort of set the stage with a short video 
that we made when we visited the Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals in Richmond, Virginia. Let's take a look at this first one. We enter at case opening the uh, parties that are used to designate the caption when the opinion's issued. We enter the parties, attorneys, lower court judges, and positive disclosure information that is relied on then to set automatic recusal links as well as by the judges who will review a disqualification report based on that information before they take any action in the case. And that all is based on information that's entered at case opening. Um, we'll set a number of deadlines at case opening. I guess another issue for me in case opening is that uh, in reviewing civil cases as they come in the office, I have to be certain that I search parties to be to hand out cases that someone else may have already put on so that we don't have two different case managers docketing the same case that possibly was sent in error or that may be a consolidation with something that we already have. Our Rule 8 motions have had a turnaround in that we have to make sure, we have to contact the attorneys as soon as we get the motion in order to make sure that we have every disqualification form possible in dealing with the parties, as well as making sure that we have the district court docket sheets. That way that we can, we can figure out the recusals for judges, make sure that the judges are available for the cases, and we can expeditiously get the cases through. Much of the jurisdictional screening in our office is done by the case manager, and if they have any doubts or questions or issues regarding it, then uh, they would refer that to an attorney in the clerk's office. Welcome back. For our first panel discussion, dealing with case screening, we have Mary Beth Kenny, case manager, trainer from the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals. Welcome, Mary Beth. And via push to talk, Susan Gelmas, supervisory motions attorney for the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals. Susan, are you there? I'm here, Bob. Thank you. Welcome, Susan. Just from viewing that opening clip, it's apparent that a lot of things happen at case opening. A lot of information is received and processed in a case is screened for a variety of purposes. Now we're going to be using a definition of screening that notes a process by which a court determines what treatment an appeal will receive and what path it will follow. So screening is done for a variety of purposes. And we have a graphic just to, to show just that. First of all, it can be screened for jurisdictional defects for suitability for court settlement or mediation programs that have been developed, whether counsel should be appointed for an unrepresented party, whether litigants have complied with court requirements or processes, whether a certificate of appealability should issue in habeas cases, whether an appeal in a habeas matter is successive, whether a pro se appeal is frivolous, indicators or weights as to the amount of time required to dispose of an appeal, whether it involves an issue already being considered by a panel, whether it involves an issue before the Supreme Court, and how much time should be allotted for oral argument. Mary Beth, let me turn to uh, you first. What happens in the Fifth Circuit when a case is first opened, when it first comes to you? Uh, when a, what's a case screen for? What's the process used? Well, when we receive the notices of appeals, they're divided by districts and the um, teams receive their notice of appeals. It could be an assistant case manager, a case manager, or a generalist who reviews the district court's cover letter to see if the fees paid, uh, what the fee status is, who the district court judge is. Um, and then they would confirm that information also with the district court's docket entries. They look to see if there's any prior appeals or related appeals. And then with this information, they determine which letter needs to be issued to the attorney. They write up an instruction sheet and give it to a case opening clerk who then goes and processes the appeal and opens the case. But before she issues that letter, it's given to our attorney advisors. The attorney advisors will decide whether we have jurisdiction. If we don't, they keep it for uh, dismissal by a panel. And the cases where we do have jurisdiction, they return it to the case opening clerk, and they will go ahead then and issue the docketing letter notifying the attorneys that the case has been opened. What are the challenges then that you think case managers, case administrators face uh, at this point? Um, at times, it's difficult to decide who your appellees are. Um, you can read the district court docket entries, and the judgment might specify who the appellee is, uh, who the losing party is. Um, if we can't tell, and it's a struggle for us at times, then we might have to call the attorney and ask him who he's appealing against. Um, other challenges may be recusals. 
the party might be uh, on our recusal list, and it's a similar party on the district court docket entries. If we can't determine that, we'll contact the judges' chambers and uh, see if, if they're related. And if we can't get in touch with the judges' chambers, then we put it in. If we're in doubt of a recusal, we go ahead and enter it as a recusal. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Mary Beth. Susan, let me uh, ask you the same question. In the Ninth Circuit, what happens? Who's responsible? And uh, what do you think are some of the, uh, the major challenges for case uh, administrators? Well, Bob, when a, an appeal first comes to the court, it's sent to one of the two docketing units in our clerk's office, the criminal or civil docketing unit, depending on the nature of the case. And they will take all the information from the district court docket, um, such as the, uh, what the type of suit is and who the parties are and uh, fee status. And once they enter all of that in the system and give it a docket number, they will set a briefing schedule uh, for the parties in all but two kinds of situations. Um, if the appeal is from a habeas case and the district court has denied a certificate of appealability, then a briefing schedule will not be set in this court until um, it's determined by a motions panel whether a certificate should issue. The other situation where the docketing clerks do not set a briefing schedule up front is in a preliminary injunction appeal under our Rule 3.3 because the staff attorneys that process those appeals will set expedited briefing schedules. Otherwise, the docketing uh, clerks will set the briefing schedules and send out some information to the parties. And at that point, they will send the appeal packets up to the staff attorneys who will review the appeals for jurisdictional defects, uh, frivolity, fee status, other kinds of case management issues, um, and uh, so that the appeal before it leaves the clerks and staff attorney's office to get forward for briefing, it will have, um, hopefully be in, you know, good shape to, to move forward. Did you have a question related to, uh, to that for, uh, Something for you Susan? mentioned, something you mentioned, you said, um, you saw the briefing notice as soon as you open the case? Yes, that's right. Um, we don't actually deal with things like recusals or waiting for records up front. Um, those things happen after the case is fully briefed uh, in our court. So that, that must move your case a lot quicker. Well, that's the idea. Um, part of why we do that is because we have so many judges here that um, looking at recusals up front really uh, would probably be over-inclusive, and so we wait to see who a panel is, what panel is going to get a case before we try to figure out what the recusals are. And in terms of records, we simply don't have the space to keep the records here until a case is ready for calendaring. Okay. okay. Uh, thanks, Susan. Let's hear from the Third Circuit. I believe we have Trish Coleman via Push to Talk. Uh, Trish, are you there? Hi, Bob. I'm here. Hi. How are you? Tell us about the screening process that's used in the Third Circuit. Does it differ in any way from what you've heard so far? Um, our case managers also review the notice of appeals for timeliness, um, fee status, fee status, appointments of counsel. But our uh, pro se cases, they fill out an information sheet, but they forward it to the staff attorney's office to review if they need a certificate of appealability or jurisdiction. But our office would send out jurisdiction letters in council cases where the staff attorney's office does it in pro se. Okay. Thanks so much, Trish. Uh, from the Fourth Circuit, we have Pat Connor, clerk of court, uh, and her staff on the line. Pat, uh, you do the screening process a little differently in the Fourth Circuit, do you not? Uh, the, there are some differences, Bob. The um, way we screen for jurisdiction here is to, uh, for civil cases, we look and uh, the case manager will review the district court docket sheet and the material sent from the district court, and then we'll um, Pat, have we lost you? Uh, am I back? Yes, you're back. Welcome back. Okay. <laughs> the, um, the case manager will then make a jurisdictional issue noted. It's an entry that we make in our docket. If it's a civil case, the case will then be reviewed by the mediation program. They take all our civil cases, and if there's a jurisdictional defect, they will review that and use that as part of the mediation process. If it's a criminal case, we will send a letter to counsel 
saying that either your appeal is untimely and you need to file a motion for, extent, for extension in the district court or invite a motion to dismiss uh, up here if it's not curable. And in pro se cases, the jurisdictional issue is handled by the staff counsel's office when they handle the appeal on its merits. Great. Um, you also have, I believe, two case managers there, and I'd like them to come forward, Karina Ida and uh, Deborah Davenport. Karina, when we spoke, uh, you talked about an effective practice or a challenge that you had regarding recusals, the identification of recusals. Do you want to highlight that now, please? Sure, Bob. One thing that we have a tough time doing, especially in emergency cases or petitions for permission to appeal, is we have to make sure that we have all disqualifications um, set aside, our, disc our disclosure statements, and also we have to make sure, especially in petition for permission to appeal, um, that we have the district court docket to make sure that there's no parties that the judges may have a conflict with for their recusals. And then once we get that, we send out, we, we grab our panel, we send out the disqualification reports to the panel so that they can decide whether or not they can proceed with the case. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, thanks. Uh, and uh, Deborah Davenport, you, um, I believe you talked to, to when we were down there about uh, a process that you uh, that you use to ensure that there won't be any confusion in terms of more than one uh, case manager being assigned and that and that problem would you like to highlight that yeah that's right Bob when the cases come in the office here we have several people that depending on the type of case that search on our system for any type of relationships uh, based on either prior cases prior prior civil numbers that are alike or prior criminal numbers that are alike or prior, if it's the same party that possibly should be related or consolidated with someone that's already here. Mm -hmm. uh, what this does, in effect, is it keeps case managers in different teams from having possibly the same case or like cases when one could do them and follow them through the court. Uh, it saves time and it also uh, keeps consolidations together for the court that they that should be together from the onset. Great. Thank, thank you so much, Deborah. We, uh, I believe we have Barbara Schemmerhorn, the clerk of the uh, U.S. Bankruptcy Appellate Panel from the Tenth Circuit on the line. Uh, Barbara, tell us how case screening progresses uh, for, uh, for you. Hello, Bob. Hi, Barbara. Well, we actually have changed our process. Originally, we had our staff attorneys screening appeals for any jurisdictional issues. Excuse me, Barbara, if you, could, if you could just turn your volume down on your TV, I think we're getting some feedback. How's that, Bob? Much better. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you. Okay, originally, we had our staff attorney screening all appeals for any jurisdictional issues, but we quickly discovered that that delayed the opening of the appeal or the prosecution of the appeal. So we authorized our case manager to actually do a lot of the initial screening. They would check for things to, like, to find out if the appeal's been timely filed, to find out if it's um, premature, and even to the point of checking whether or not uh, an order is interlocutory, because with bankruptcy appeals, we deal with that issue quite a bit. And we found that we've reduced the time that it takes to open an appeal. That's great. Thank you so much. Um, by the way, the list of uh, what cases may be screened for is from a recent Federal Judicial Center publication entitled Case Management Procedures in the Federal Courts of Appeals. Uh, published this year, it provides a uh, careful description and comparison of case management variations among the appellate courts, uh, all the way from case opening through case closing, and includes pro se, uh, PILRA, habeas co uh, cases, uh, and so forth. If you'd like a copy, you can make the request directly by going to the FJC website on the DCN. Again, that address is jnet.fjc.dcn. I think we have just a few minutes left. Is, are there any other push-to-talk courts that might like to, uh, to either ask a question or, uh, or tell us how case, uh, just take a minute to uh, tell us how uh, this case screening process works in their circuit? Okay, let me thank you so much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mary Beth, and thank you so much, Susan. And uh, let's now move to our second topic, and that is communication. Here's a short film clip. I think the greatest challenge in appellate case opening is the difficulty and complexity 
in making sure that all the parties, all the case managers, all the staff are aware of all the important, um, ever-changing policies and procedures in appellate case opening. It is very difficult at times to keep up with the amount of material that continues to flow through the court. At the present time, we have a 31-section manual that um, is very difficult to keep updated because of the continuing changing rules and laws. And obviously, as the laws and rules change, our procedures must change, and that information must be given to the case managers. We work very well here at our peers together. We've, we've been here a long time. Uh, we understand each other's ways, and one may have know something more than I know or the other. Uh, so we rely on each other's expertise to, to get what we need. The press can be very persistent, um, and they ask questions that I, as a deputy clerk, cannot answer for them. And I have, at that, that point, I have to direct them to the, either the clerk or the deputy clerk or just explain to them that this information is just not going to be given to them until the, the time deemed appropriate by the court. One of the most important things in handling death penalty cases is communication between the various courts, the district court, our court, the Supreme Court, as well as communication with the attorneys. In this segment of our program, we're going to be talking about communication. And by that we mean, how do we keep abreast of the many changes that occur in the FRAP rules, local rules, and IOPs? And how do we make sure attorneys, all court customers, are made aware of these changes, as well as communicating with each other and other court units? It's not always an easy task, given the fact that many times the information we might need might be at a distance. Let me introduce our panel to you. You've already met Mary Beth Kenny, case manager trainer from the Fifth Circuit. And joining us today is Betsy Shoemaker, chief deputy clerk of the Tef Tenth Circuit. Betsy, let's start with you this time. If you'll please set the stage for us, what are the key communication links that need to exist in order to open up a case, and what challenges do they uh, present for the case administrator? Well, Bob, I think that communication is a lot like screening that we were just talking about. It is an umbrella issue. It permeates everything that we do, both at case opening and every other stage along the way. Communication is really important because it goes in so many different directions. At case opening, we're looking at communication with district court personnel, with staff attorneys, with other court personnel and other units. We're also looking at how we communicate with the parties, whether they're pro se litigants or retained counsel. And we in the Tenth Circuit have come at that a lot of different ways. We use technology as much as we can and as well as we can to communicate well with each other and with all the people involved in the appeal. All of our deputy clerks are very email literate. Everybody uses email. Uh, we also use the chaser system, which is the district court docket. We tap right into that from um, our desktop computers and use that a lot to make sure that we've got the right information if we need something from a preliminary record, for example. We also talk to each other a lot. Um, in our court, the deputy clerks are all case, or excuse me, generalists, and so we are all working on appeals at the same time. We talk to each other about what's going on, um, and that helps us make sure that we get the right information into the case at the beginning so that we don't have problems later. Some of the particular challenges we've had, Bob, relate to things like ICMS forms, the forms that come out of Ames. We've worked very hard to make them understandable for both attorneys and pro se litigants. We also have a lot of information on our web page. We use the internet a lot to make sure that attorneys coming in have the information they need to file the appeal. Um, and that has been a very useful tool for us. So those are some of the things that we use to communicate with each other and with attorneys and pro se litigants. So attorneys know that they can go to your website and, and see what's the latest, if you will, in the FRAP rules and so forth, or whether or not there are any changes that have, uh, have come about, any local rules. Absolutely. They can go to our website to get that information. When the rules changes came out in early 1999, we also created a paragraph in our forms that went out in every letter we generated that said right up front, look everybody, there's some big rule changes, take a look at them, and that was very effective also. And I'm sure very appreciated. Yeah. Mary Beth, Fifth Circuit, what would you add to that? Um, I can say we do a lot of the same things. Uh, the internet 
great um, information right there. We have uh, frequently asked questions and answers on the internet. We have a practitioner's guide, which is very, very beneficial to the attorneys. Uh, and our local rules are there also. Um, when we issue letters to the attorneys, we put attachments. Sometimes we'll use different color pages that uh, will bring it to their attention. Uh, with the district courts, we phone them and we CC mail them. It depends on the different district courts. Some of them like a CC mail, some of them you know, are okay with the phone calls. Um, and then, too, we can view the district court docket sheet, which is beneficial. We don't have to necessarily call the district court. We can view it to get our information. Okay. So what you'll do is you, you can, you'll have access to the district court docket sheets, at least to see it. it that might clear up uh, and give you the information if you, uh, if you need it. But if not, you have to contact the district court either by email or how is that done? Well, correct. If we have uh, some information, we could issue a letter to an attorney and not knowing, we could advise him that a motion has been, uh, is pending in district court. He might call us and advise us otherwise. Well, by checking the district court's docket, maybe they weren't current with their information. So we kind of had the uh, wrong information, so we would have to call the district court and clarify it. So they may not be current with their documents. Thanks again uh, to uh, Betsy and Mary Beth. Let me again encourage our listeners to fax in any questions you might have, or if you're uh, a push to talk, uh, uh, please do uh, uh, let us know, and if you uh, want to talk about uh, how this works in your circuit, uh, we'd really like to hear from you. One of our push-to-talk sites, the Fourth Circuit, has developed a method to keep uh, attorneys aware of the changes in the FRAP rules and, and local rules, and I believe we have Mark Zancelli, Chief Deputy of the Fourth Circuit, on the line. Mark, uh, uh, explain what you do and also what's been the reaction of attorneys. Uh, hi, Bob. Hi, Mark. Um, yes, we uh, used several of the resources that were mentioned uh, by both your panelists. Uh, the, sometimes uh, high-tech solutions work well. We can refer people to the Internet, and sometimes the low, very low-tech, very simple solutions work, such as using different color uh, paper attached to, to notices. Uh, we found with attorneys that, uh, who frequently practice before the court that they often would not read everything that was sent to them. And if we just made a, a change or two in the notices that wasn't highlighted, they wouldn't see it. So we started using different color paper, particularly to highlight very important changes, such as the FRAP changes that were effective in December of 1998. We found that to be a very effective practice. And they very much appreciate it, I'm, I'm sure. Now, you also have an internal manual, I understand. And uh, uh, Susan Wagley, I believe that you're, you're responsible for uh, keeping that uh, that manual updated. Could you explain that the process you use for keeping it updated? Hi, Bob. As stated before, we have a 31 section manual that case managers use to process their cases and manage their cases as they go through the system. Uh, depending on the complexity of the change, we utilize different ways of communicating those updates to case managers. At times, we have meetings um, with maybe a PowerPoint demonstration of changes or other changes might simply warrant memos outlining the changes with a hard copy of the updated section in the manual, while very minor changes can be handled through CC mail. Okay. Well, thank you so much, uh, Susan. Um, I think the Second Circuit is also on the line. Kathy Brower? Kathy, are you there? Hi, Bob. Yes, I'm here. Hi, Kathy. Uh, you, may want to turn, you may want to turn down the volume because we're getting a little bit of feedback. Okay. Okay? H how's that now? Uh, I think we're still getting it. Uh, now? If you can turn it down when you're speaking, that would be great. Uh, Leave has turned it all the way down just about. Can you hear me? It's perfect. No. Yes, we can hear you. Okay, fine. <laughs> okay, talk about, talk about what you do in the Second Circuit, please. Okay. Uh, unfortunately, in the Second Circuit, we're not quite ready to uh, communicate through cyberspace. Uh, so we do things the old-fashioned way, uh, much, much like uh, it's been described in some of the other circuits. Uh, we, we send out what we call a civil information packet at the time uh, the case is opened, either at the time we send out a docketing letter or when we send out the initial scheduling order. And uh, that's a 20-some-odd that's page document. It's pretty thorough. Uh, we also have uh, a different set of instructions for a criminal appeal. And we have a supplement for those uh, civil cases which happen to be habeas appeals. Um, 
when we have a rule change, which we, we recently did um, uh, have a, a, a new interim rule that became effective in May of this year, uh, and uh, we, our clerk uh, sent copies to a, a managing attorney's association so that they could disseminate it to most of the mid-size and large firms in New York. And we also, of course, published it and uh, sent out copies in our with our information packets, uh, so that you know solo practitioners and smaller firms and everyone, in fact, would uh, get notice of it. Um, and uh, as I say, we we have used color paper in the past, but we haven't been doing that recently, just because of the uh, it's just more efficient to quickly xerox these packets on you know in one. Uh, you know, fell swoop at the Xerox machine without changing color paper. But I think that is a very effective tool. As Mark pointed out, um, attorneys and pro se litigants don't always read everything. In fact, most of the times they don't read things, <laughs> we found. So that, uh, you know, we, we need to try to compensate for that. In fact, one of our local rule changes um, has actually set forth clearly that we only require 10 copies of a brief to be filed even though our scheduling order sets that forth, sets forth the number of copies in every single case and we send it out in every single case, people simply don't read that. They read the dates that the brief is due and then they put it away. So we've actually implemented a rule change to, um, to help people notice that they don't have to file too many copies. Thank uh, you so much, Kathy. Uh, we have uh, I can't. We have Sorry, I can't hear you. Oh, We're okay. Just a moment. I'll leave as though fixing it. Okay. Go ahead, Bob. Okay, I just wanted to thank you so much for participating and, and, and telling us what's, been, uh, what's done in the Second Circuit regarding communication. Okay. Um, you may now want to release that push to talk bar that, uh, that you have there. Um, we also have Sharon Evans uh, on the line from the Eleventh Circuit via push to talk. And Sharon submitted an effective practice that I think is apropos to our discussion on communication since it involved changing a number of local rules and then, co and then communicating that uh, to uh, a lot of court customers. Sharon, if you're there, can you explain what was done? I'm here, Bob. Hi, Sharon. How our are you? Our court had directed us to try to reduce our median time. So we looked at different areas that would help us try to do. One of the things was changing the rules so that we could expedite our briefing time uh, involved our local rules where we deemed the record complete in the district court, started our briefing time from that point. Uh, we notified the attorneys through special paper, uh, internet rules, telephone calls. Another area that we identified that was a problem was our court reporters and our district courts. We invited our district court personnel to a meeting that involved our judges and the chief district court judges agreed upon different procedures that we would begin using. So we brought the district court people in on our problem, made them part of the solution, and have reduced our median time. Also at this time, we were able to identify problem court reporters uh, and, in fact, have influenced one of our district courts to discontinue using an outside service that was a problem. So that's a great example, I think, of, of changing rules and getting a lot of individuals uh, involved uh, as part of the, uh, the communication uh, that's so necessary. Uh, later in the broadcast, we're going to be talking about uh, communicating with pro se's and the challenges that uh, uh, that, that presents, uh, not only, for, again, from a communication standpoint, but also from a, a logistical uh, a standpoint. Let's take this opportunity in just uh, the few minutes that we have left in this particular topic to open it up to any other of the push to talk courts that uh, that wish to make a contribution. Bob? Yes. It's, uh, Trish Coleman from the Third Circuit. Hi again, Trish. Um, we had some problems with the, the state of how the records and the appeal packets were coming up with our district courts. So what we did is we devised um, a manual and checklist for the appellate clerks, the district courts, which we found very helpful. And approximately once a year, we will actually go out to the district courts, meet with them, meet with the clerks, answer some questions, and try to explain what our needs are and why we need the records set up in such a way. And we found that to be very effective. 
that sounds very effective, and I'm sure there are there are other courts that might be interested even in seeing what you've uh, uh, what you've developed. Uh, are there any other uh, comments from any of the other push to talk courts? Okay, uh, let's then take uh, a minute. And let's uh, turn to our third topic on uh, on quality control, and uh, let's take a look at this short uh, video segment. At the present time, using the AIM system, case managers are enter the data. They make the, do the docket entries, all the forms are generated off of that system. In the future, and not too distant future, uh, attorneys will take the role of uh, the data entry people. Case managers will become more quality control people, and they will review the work that attorneys do to ensure compliance, ensure that the case number is correct and the, and the name of the form is correct. One of the, the challenges and one of our problem areas has been in flagging or identifying death penalty cases when they come into the office. The district court clerks uh, don't always mark them as death penalty cases and they are docketed differently. We are required to enter parties on the docket the way the district court does and it's very important that we um, abide by what they have and also be certain that it's, the spelling is correct which often it is not and to make some judgment calls as to what we should do as case managers. Should we do it incorrectly because that's the way it's done or should we correct it and, and let the district courts know they need to update their own docket? Um, there again, quality is a big issue. So it's that sort of um, a real ability to um, think about the case from a larger perspective that's very valuable um, in the work here. Welcome back. In this segment, we're going to be talking about quality control. You know, there's a wonderful, very short article by Natalie Gable entitled, Is 99.9% .9 Good Enough? And in it, she talks about the negative impact of willingly accepting less than the best in quality. And she notes that in the language of the Malcolm Baldridge National Quality Award, quality is a race with no finish line. And that's especially true in the service that we provide. In this segment, we're going to be talking about what we do in order to ensure the information we receive and input is free of mistakes. How do we check ourselves? Our panel of one is Betsy Shoemaker, who you've already met, the Chief Deputy from the Tenth Circuit. And we're going to be turning again to a number of push-to-talk sites as, as they talk about ensuring quality control. Betsy. Like communication, quality control is one of those overriding challenges that it just seems so greatly impacts everything else. So what do you think are the implications for appellate case opening, setting deadlines, identifying parties, etc.? And what, uh, what are those challenges that are brought about by uh, trying to ensure effective quality control? Well, Bob, I think that quality is everywhere. That's one thing every circuit has in common is that we are trying to do everything right all the time. How to ensure quality in an environment where the paper never stops coming and the phone never stops ringing it is, the real, is the real crux of the thing. And we in the Tenth Circuit found about four or five years ago that although everything was going fine, we are in a position where we weren't turning things around as quickly as we thought we should the quality going in at case opening perhaps wasn't as good as we wanted it to be. Because at that juncture, it is so important to have quality. I mean, obviously it is everywhere else, but if you make a misstep at that initial crucial stage, then the appeal could go the wrong way, you could set the wrong deadline, it could come up to bite you later on down the road in the appeal. And that's, that's where um, the really important thing is at case opening with quality. And at that point, you're looking at the information you put into the system. You've got to set the right deadlines. You've got to try and get the right fee status up there. You've got to get the caption right, um, and because it can cause problems if you don't. You've got to put the parties in properly. Uh, we had an appeal last week where we probably had 10 different parties with three different cross appeals. It was very difficult to figure out who the appellees were and who the appellants were. Getting that right at the beginning is what quality is all about. And what we did in the Tenth Circuit about four years ago was initiate a vehicle that actually the FJC brought to us, which is the Total Quality Service Plan. A lot of you out there have heard about some of the things we're doing. And we came at quality from a lot of different angles at that point. 
we created a procedures manual, not unlike what the Fourth Circuit has been talking about, which is online. We went through everything we do and looked at how it should be done and put it out. Um, it's online, so all of our deputies and everyone in the office can take a look at it. It's got um, links to forms and orders and examples and takes everyone through step by step exactly how a case should be opened. That brings us con consistency. It's been very, very effective. We created a standards committee which looks at how we docket things. Um, you know, everything from typos to using the proper event. And that is made up of deputy clerks along with our operations manager. And that's been a very effective tool to get, you know, quality in, quality out. Um, we have also interviewed our, who are our customers, which our customers are everyone from our judges to the people in the file room who help us out, help the case managers out when things are being opened, get records for us. We interviewed attorney focus groups. We talked to everyone that we interact with to see what they needed. And again, that helped us at case opening because it allowed us to, you know, do for people what they needed at the initiation of the appeal. So case opening is a very, very important uh, place for quality. And the way we have affected quality at that point is through the, this total quality service uh, program. The other thing we do is we've created some reports in AIMS that have helped us check our own quality. All the case managers get reports on their daily docketing. So they actually can look at what they did that day or every couple, three days, and look at their events and see how they look. Are there typos, problems, issues that, that have come up? And they can use those reports, all of our case managers have editor privileges, to go back and correct things right off the bat. So that is a big piece of our quality also. People are looking at their own work to figure out if things are done correctly. So it's really been a multi-front uh, attack um, to make sure that we're doing things right at the case opening stage. And the result of it has been, Bob, that we have uh, reduced our turnaround time and case opening and virtually everything else to about 24 hours from the time it walks in the door. You're right about communication and quality. They're both such important front end necessities. Mm -hmm. It takes, in order to do a real, to ensure good quality control, there has to be that, uh, that communication. You have to work with the district courts and everything and so, uh, in that area. Talk a little bit, if you don't mind, um, a little bit more about case captioning and what might be some of those challenges and how you ensured uh, ensured quality. Did you have to go back to the district courts and so? Sometimes. <clears throat> um, and, and again, that relates back to communication. We, like I'm sure everyone else out there, create a caption when we do the case opening, when we're putting in those parties. We use, of course, the information that we get from the district court docket sheet to do that. But we are checking very carefully to make sure that those parties are identified properly. Is it a move-in appellant? Is it a cross-claimant appellee intervener? Uh, whatever it is. So we are not just taking the information, you know, wrote off of the district court docket sheet. We're reviewing it and analyzing it again to make sure it's proper. In our court, the caption that we create is the caption that Chambers uses when they set up their opinion, you know, their final disposition opinion. So it's really essential that we review that information. And if we get one of those huge civil appeals or perhaps a criminal appeal with multiple co-defendants, we are very careful to ensure that that caption is set up properly and that we've used the right naming conventions, which is another way we ensure quality is to have naming conventions for how we do things, so that down the road there are not issues that, that we missed that, that could have been fixed from the, from the beginning. In discussions that we've had with the various uh, appellate courts, uh, we note that in some cases individuals check their own work, in some cases teams check their own work, or other teams work. It's, uh, it's very interesting. Um, so uh, let's turn to uh, Opal Carter from the Tenth Circuit. Opal submitted an effective practice that, uh, that further described the, their, their total quality uh, uh, program. Opal, would you like to describe the challenge that uh, you and other staff uh, uh, faced and uh, what's the relationship to the total quality? Yes, this is Opal Carter from the Tenth Circuit. Our biggest challenge was to make our docket public friendly. Uh, before we had our total quality service program, we could docket almost any way we wanted to and used uh, not always standard abbreviations, things that the public 
would not understand, although the court community would. And so the first thing we had to do was to start making our docket public friendly uh, when we went online. Um, with our standards committee, uh, they checked our uh, dockets with the files. That was a, a mammoth undertaking in the beginning. Uh, when we all got the hang of what we were doing, then we started checking our own work. Uh, with, with systems uh, cooperation, uh, we have a daily report that we run, and we can look at our own work or we can turn it over to someone else on the team to look at and point out any corrections because sometimes you can look at your own work and not realize that that is an error. So we look at our own work, we have someone else look at it, and periodically the Standards Committee looks at it. That sounds very all-inclusive. Um, let's open the line up to other push-to-talk courts. Um, we have some folks we want to go to, but let's, go, let's open the line. Are there any other push-to-talk courts out there that would like to describe the process they use to ensure quality when data is entered and so forth? Anybody out there? Okay, let's turn then to the, to the District of Columbia. Uh, Carmen Gooding, I believe you're uh, on the line. Um, how do you... We're getting a little bit of feedback. In fact, we're getting a lot of feedback. Uh, if you could... If uh, when you speak, if you could turn the volume on your television way down, we'll still be able to hear you. Is that good, Bob? Oh, that, that's wonderful, Carmen. It's so still a little bit, but uh, that's wonderful. If, okay. If you want to talk then about the quality control program in the, uh, for the circuit court in the District of Columbia, we'd like to hear about it. Okay. In this circuit, Bob, what we do is quality control is governed by two um, parties. That's the systems administrator and myself. The systems administrator handles most everything that has to do with systems. <laughs> uh, being technical, anything that may have um, anything to do with the tables and the background, the initial programming of the reports and things like that. In the clerk's office, the quality control person, myself, deals with the, re the end user reports. In other words, after everything has been done, what we do is between the case administrators and the operations manager and myself, we check and verify those reports and um, that way we can pick up any errors. Pretty much I would chime in on everybody else that's already spoken throughout the course of the day to say that we came across problems we resolved the problems by coming up with a report that would show us when the problem occurred and then a resolution and how to fix it. So because we're all contained within the same building with the one district court that we take appeals from, it's much easier for us to keep a tighter rein on, on errors and resolutions. That's great. Thanks so much, Carmen. Um, in the second circuit, I believe we have Monica Jones on the line. Monica, are you there? Good afternoon, Bob. Good afternoon, Monica. How are you? Fine, thank you. Good. Talk to us a little bit about the second circuit. What, uh, is it the same as what you've heard, or do you have a little different way of uh, monitoring quality? Uh, I, I do reports every day, and I review the docket entries of each case manager and supervisor. I'm looking for errors, overdue deadlines, any documents that look like they should have been here on time and we haven't received them yet. I review for spelling errors, clarity in the docket entry itself, and I also review to make sure the case is being monitored and sent to the appropriate staff attorney. So you actually, um, let me tell you again about the feedback. If you don't mind turning down the volume on, on your set there, we'll still be able to hear you while you're talking. So do you do then all the monitoring yourself, or do you have folks that work with you? Do you do it as part of a team? How does that work? I'm a one-person team, and I review the docket entries for all the case managers, which would be a total of about 24 now, and all the supervisors. Okay. Um, changing the subject only slightly, um, 
uh, death pen. I think you want to remove your the the bar. So, thank you very much. Uh, death penalty cases. Uh, it, in this case, the ability to flag or identify those cases, which are capital cases, can also be a uh, a serious quality challenge, uh, if you will. And as you saw in the film clip, Beth Walton from the Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals in Richmond is the capital case coordinator. And uh, Beth, just how much of a quality issue then is, uh, is what you do in terms of uh, being able to flag capital cases? Bob, quality is always an issue in death penalty cases, um, as well as communication. Uh, we've developed a database of the death penalty cases. The attorneys are given a cert cert certificate that they fill out when they file papers in the district court in a capital case. The district court clerks give them to the attorneys. They fill it out regarding the party's name, um, any other proceedings in other courts, execution dates, things of that nature. Uh, the attorneys who are representing them, those in turn are sent to me, and I enter those that information into a database, and then I track that case from that point all the way through the district court till it gets to the appeal stage, through the Supreme Court, and then through any execution that may be set. So you're kept aware. You know when something might be approaching the appellate court, and uh, yeah. know when it uh, might approximately get there. So you're you're going to kind of keep an eye to make sure that when it comes into the court, it's flagged as a capital case. Yes, I do. As soon as it's entered into the, uh, as soon as the party has filed papers in the federal system, I get notification either from the attorneys or from the district court uh, of that case and then follow it all the way through um, termination. Okay. Thanks. Let's again open this up to the other push to talk courts uh, out there. We're really interested in finding out what you do, if, even if it's the same, what you do to ensure uh, a quality, uh, the information that comes in uh, and so and is entered. Are there any other push to talk courts that would like to uh, talk about uh, the system that they use? Okay, uh, uh, Betsy, any final thoughts in terms of, of quality or? Well, I thought the, the Fourth Circuit discussion on capital cases was very interesting. I was very interested in how you do it. Uh, we have set up procedures in the 10th um, to change fairly dramatically how we open capital cases. Um, and we've been doing it for about a year and a half. The court entered an on-bank order which set forth new procedures for the processing of capital cases. And what we do is, we don't have as many capital cases as the fourth, but when they come in, we have a deputy clerk who is uh, a capital case clerk, um, and she opens the case. And at case opening, we do what we call a case management order. And what that does is it requires counsel to have a video conference uh, with one of our judges and myself. And what we do is we set it about 40 days after the notice of appeal is filed. And at that case, there is a discussion regarding the briefing schedule, any issues regarding the record, COA issues. And the whole thing is hammered out by video conference. Um, and it's been a very, very effective tool to not only flag those cases coming in because we're looking at them very carefully, but we've got just a couple people, and I know in some circuits it would have to be a number more, uh, following those cases through because they're so resource intensive. So our case management order is a way to deal with COA budget. We have an ex parte conference at the same time with counsel to talk about budget issues and just talk about all those deadlines and the things that you're usually fleshing out with orders or briefing schedules at the beginning of a case. The other thing we've done on capital cases which has been very effective is that the uh, head of the appellate section at the Attorney General's office in Oklahoma, which is our, our heavy, heavy, heavy hitter excuse me, um, for capital cases, does a monthly report which shows us the status of all capital cases in the state of Oklahoma, whether they are at the state direct stage or all the way through the federal district court stage. So we monthly get a report that tells us exactly where every capital case is in the state of Oklahoma. And there's about 150 of them, so it's been a very effective tool. And we communicate with the Attorney General's office to do that, and they've been very helpful. That is a very, very efficient tool in terms of our ability to do quality analysis and quality control on those capital cases. Okay. Thank you so much, Betsy. 
Uh, let's now turn then to our final segment on uh, other case opening logistics. And here's a short film clip. One of the challenges faced in case opening that is uh, among the more interesting challenge, challenges are, is created in a situation where you have cases that don't fit easily into one category or another, the quasi-civil, quasi-criminal cases where the procedures that we're required to, file, to follow depend so much on how the case is identified, but a case may be considered civil for one purpose and criminal for another purpose and until there's been a final resolution of how that case should be handled for this particular procedural requirement that the clerk's office needs to follow, there's a period of trying to make an educated guess and trying to identify a case that can be used to resolve the issue, and um, that usually uh, will create some interesting challenges at case opening. I face many challenges. Probably the greatest one is um, assisting the pro se litigants. As pro se's, they do not have the knowledge that the lawyers may have and they don't have access to the rules that the lawyers have. So I, we have to do a lot more hand holding for them and guiding them through the appellate process. A lot of times they will call back and you know want to know well what stage is it at and you know how long is it going to take from here and will the judges see everything that I give you, will they see the entire district court record? So I have to assure them that everything possible is being done to make sure that they will receive all of the attention that they need as far as their appeal is concerned. Our fourth and final segment today is sort of a catch-all. We're going to talk and uh, touch on and discuss a number of subject areas. The role in you saw talks about those situations to quote Pat Connor a clerk of the Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals that just don't fit easily into one category or another. It also noted the challenges in dealing with pro se litigants and we're going to talk about both of these and as mentioned before as well as other subjects. As always we want to give you the chance to ask a question or to uh, share an experience uh, via push to talk uh, or fax. Again that fax number uh, should be on the screen right now and do take advantage of it. Our faculty for this uh, session are via push to talk, Susan Gelmis from the Ninth Circuit. Hello again, Susan. Hi, Bob. I'm still here. Okay. And Frank Perez, uh, case manager, prisoner appeals for the Second Circuit Court of Appeals. Uh, Frank, let's start with uh, you first. Most of your experience has been in dealing with uh, pro se appeals, originally uh, dealing with all pro se's across the board, and then uh, in the last three years dealing primarily with cases involving uh, habeas petitions. Explain the process that's used in your circuit and what you feel are the, the greatest challenges that you face and, and other case managers when they're opened. Okay, Bob. Um... I'll explain some of the procedures, but uh, I think s most of these have been covered already by the previous panelists. Uh, so I'll, you know, I'll explain some of the uh, process we do. Really, I'd like to talk about some intangibles okay. that go into processing an appeal, I think. Okay. Uh, I think they're important. Uh, by intangibles, I mean uh, aggressiveness and uh, getting what you need to pursue an appeal, uh, diplomacy when dealing with the people, and uh, just um, uh, just persistence. Now, as far as when, uh, what we do when we open up an appeal, it, uh, it has been screened already by the intake department. But when we get it, our department get it, gets it, we'll screen it again to just make sure. There, there is a fine line between a habeas case, a, an appeal from a habeas denial and a, an application uh, for a second or successive habeas. So we, uh, we do make sure that it's not, you know, classified incorrectly. Um, we have, have some uh, instances where an, a, a, petitioner, a, petitioner, I'm sorry, a petitioner submitted his application before we got a transfer order from a district court judge. Mm -hmm. So we ended up having two cases for the same guy, even though it was in reference to one case. So that, that has to be screened properly, and uh, that's uh, a hurdle. Um, also, we, uh, if it's a habeas appeal, what we look for is the uh, record. 
the record normally would contain the uh, state court proceedings if it's an appeal of a state habeas or uh, trial transcripts from the underlying criminal case. So I, um, again, a big challenge is getting the record to be complete so that when the, uh, the law clerks and the panel looks at a case, uh, they're not looking at it and we're not being, um, it's not a pressing issue, a last moment pressing issue. Mm -hmm. Um, so that, that's part of the uh, process, but that's uh, outlined in writing. We have a, a manual, so you know if someone's um, dedicated enough, they can get the uh, procedures down pretty well. Uh, but I think a really important thing is work attitude, the, the way a person goes about it, the way they pursue a case, and um, uh, you can be aggressive about it. You can, um, let's say, you're missing state court proceedings in a record. You can try the district court. They might. Uh, they usually say they gave us everything they've had. They they had. So then we might try the respondent's um, attorney. Mm -hmm. So we'll request from them, and there are times they don't have them. So then we're you know we're caught in a bind. So we go back to the district court, but we try not to be um, confrontational or just upset about the fact that we're going back and forth. Uh, but, uh, you know, you definitely have to use some diplomacy and persistence because uh, if the district court is telling you they don't have them and the DA's office uh, is telling you they don't have them and you know one of them has it, <laughs> you have to keep trying both parties until, you know, something gives. And it usually does. Recently I had a case where I tried the district court. They, the appeals clerk said, no, we don't have them, we gave you everything. Uh, I tried the, uh, the respondent's attorney and for uh, about a month or so I, I kept trying and, him, uh, and I knew he was trying. But the law clerk who re requested these things, they, she was getting impatient so she was ready to issue a, an order to um, compel somebody. <laughs> so I went back to both sides and, said, and I explained, listen, this is going to happen. Uh, it gets kind of messy in this friction when this happens. Can you guys double check? And the district court appeals clerk, I actually spoke to a different appeals clerk this time. It was by accident, but uh, she found him. She found uh, three boxes full of transcripts. So the uh, persistence uh, helped, and uh, again, I, was, I felt that was pretty diplomatic, because otherwise they probably just wouldn't have looked after the initial time. So uh, I think that's important. It's uh, really how you go about it. And I think you have to be persistent because I, I know that in certain situations a person will give an initial attempt and maybe uh, two weeks later they'll give another attempt because they were reminded to, but that's it. And I don't think, uh, I don't think that that's the way to do it. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, I'm sorry. No, no, no. Um, Susan, what would you add from the Ninth Circuit? Well, we've put a lot of energy and thought in, to, in the Ninth Circuit um, in creating efficient procedures for dealing with pro se appeals. We have um, about 10,000 appeals filed here annually, and a third of those are pro se. So that's uh, a lot of cases that um, are a little bit more difficult to manage usually because they don't know the rules or because some of them are vexatious litigants. Um, and, you know, when you get jaded in looking at the vexatious ones, you don't want to be um, throwing out the uh, meritorious ones as well. So we've um, set up some procedures that I think have been very useful in weeding out the jurisdictionally defective or frivolous or vexatious pro se appeals and for then managing the remaining pro se appeals in a way that will um, ensure that they get the attention that um, that other appeals get and that they will go more smoothly through the system because case management issues have been um, have been coordinated and resolved um, one of the ways that we do that is just with the initial screening um, screening out jurisdictionally defective or frivolous appeals um, we also have a pretty um, uh, comprehensive system for dealing with vexatious pro se litigants we have now a list of that's three pages, single space long, of names of pro se litigants who have pre-filing review orders in this court, and any new appeal that they try to file has to be uh, weeded through a panel first, a motions panel, before an appeal is even opened. 
and if the panel feels that the appeal is frivolous or um, in some way vexatious, uh, they will simply not allow it to be opened, and so it never gets on the docket. Um, that's been a really effective way of uh, keeping uh, keeping the vexatious and uh, sort of um, otherwise distracting appeals uh, out of the picture so that the court can focus on the other appeals. And on the other side of that, we also have a pro bono program where we appoint pro bono counsel to represent pro se litigants in civil appeals that um, the court feels has some merit or raises an issue of first impression or is complicated and where the court would be um, benefited by having counsel. So we try to handle sort of both ends of the spectrum. Okay. Anything to add, uh, Frank? Uh, or? Mm, well, a question. Susan, when uh, you have a uh, pro se yes. who... Uh, and I, most of my cases deal with uh, inmates, of course, uh, you know, habeas appeals. When you have someone that uh, you would consider vexatious, uh, uh, specifically, if you have a threatening letter from an inmate, what happens then? How, how do you handle that? Well, actually, um, a threatening letter, something that seems to impact the personal security of anybody at the court, is actually referred uh, to a security officer um, of the court to deal with. But in terms of people who are filing um, lots and lots of frivolous cases and, uh, you know, the court has already dismissed or summarily affirmed 15 of their appeals and they keep on going, um, and what we do is um, I prepare an order to show cause that is signed by our appellate commissioner that lays out the history of the person's um, appeals in this court and what happened to those appeals. It lays out what um, the standards are in issuing these kinds of vexatious litigant orders, and it gives them an opportunity to show cause why the court should not uh, enter such an order, and it actually contains the language of the proposed pre-filing review order in the order to show cause, so they can see exactly what's going to happen to them if they don't satisfy the court that uh, we shouldn't enter the order. Then if there's a response filed, um, that response then goes to a motions panel of three judges. If the motions panel is not convinced by the pro se that uh, they shouldn't enter the order, then they will go ahead and enter the pre-filing review order at that time. Um, all of this is done in an 8,000 miscellaneous docket that's created for this purpose. And anytime future appeals come in, um, they are lodged in that 8,000 docket rather than um, being opened with a new docket number until or unless the court gives permission to open it. Frank, do you do that similarly in a similar fashion in the uh, in the Second Circuit? Uh, yeah, in some aspects. Uh, actually, can I ask you another question, Susan? Oh, actually, let, let me uh, tell you what of we what, what we get. Uh, when we open up a case, we usually need the uh, filing fee to be addressed by the uh, appellant uh, inmate. So, um, you know, we'll send out a letter asking them to either pay the filing fee or submit a motion for informer pauperous status. Um, they'll submit some documents, but it's never clear what they're asking for if they're responding to my request. So a lot of times I'll get ten pages of the guy telling me why he shouldn't be in jail and then in the last page the last sentence he will say oh by the way I don't have money for the <laughs> for paying the filing fee so do you have problems with the ciphering what pro se's are asking for I know we do yes that's definitely been a, a common problem here at this court um, one of the things that uh, the court did when it set up what we call the pro se unit, um, which is three paralegals and an administrative person and myself, um, it is now a subset of the larger motions unit. But when the pro se unit was set up, one of the things that it was designed to do was to help the court in deciphering and construing pro se filings that it really wasn't clear what people were asking for. Sometimes they're trying to file things where they don't have a pending proceeding in this court, and it's not clear whether they're trying to get some kind of relief or whether they just need information, or they file things in the context of a proceeding, but we have no idea from just looking at it what they're asking for. And so that's something that we've developed a kind of specialty in uh, in the pro se unit in trying to decipher and construe. And, you know, we may not always get it right in terms of what's intended, but, you know, it's at least we're trying to be consistent in the way we do it. It's, 
Thanks so much, Susan. Um, I want to turn. Now, I want to now talk to uh, Jay Hargett, uh, Joy Hargett. I'm sorry, from the uh, the Fourth Circuit. Uh, uh, Joy, talk to us a little bit uh, more about the challenges that uh, that you face. I know you're right at the counter, and I know you deal n uh, both with pro se's and also the press. Talk a little bit about some of those challenges for us. Uh, hi, Bob. Hi, Joy. Um, some of the challenges we face are that the pro se's locally will actually come into the office and request to see the file or, or request to see the record, you know, because they're not sure that um, everything is that they've submitted is being um, handled properly or being submitted to the court. So they want to they want reassurance that you know they're getting the same treatment that a uh, and a, a pro se with an attorney, I mean a litigant with an attorney would have. So you know just reassuring them and and making letting them know that they are being treated fairly is uh, probably the biggest problem we have. Uh, from the Tenth Circuit, uh, Ardell Ardell Schuler uh, is on the line. Uh, tell us how that uh, how that works in the Tenth Circuit, Ardell. Hi, Bob. Um, one of the things I want to talk about, I guess, is um, how second or successive matters are handled in our court. What we do is we make a determination um, when it comes in if it's a transfer from the district court order or if it's a direct motion for for a second or successive 2254 or 2255. What we do is we check the number and we also check um, the name of the movement in our system and we see what kind of cases they may have and how many cases they've filed. We write them down and then we give them to our jurisdictional attorneys. Um, once we've submitted it to our jurisdictional attorneys, they review it. We do not docket the motion or open up a case until they return it to the um, individual case manager. Once the jurisdictional attorney has reviewed the motion, they give it back to the case manager and um, they'll give the okay to open up the case or to docket the motion. And we'll make a note as to who is working on that case at that time so we can submit all the proper documents to that person. Um, if it's a transfer order from the district court, the case will be opened and um, let's see, the movement will be given 30 days to file a motion for permission to file a second or successive 2254 or 2255. A letter will be sent to the movement with a set of instructions and a, a motion form. When the motion is actually re received, we will submit it to the jurisdictional attorney before it's placed on the docket. Um, if the situation comes up where the movement files a motion directly with the court, what we do is we give it to the jurisdictional attorneys, they'll okay it, and we'll open up the case at that point. The file date that we use is the date that the jurisdictional attorney gives the motion back to us not the date that we receive, because this allows them to have that 30-day timeline from the time that the motion is filed to the day the, enter, or the order is entered, and it just kind of gives a little bit of room you know, to play with so that the judges can review things too. Um, let's see, like I said, the 30-day timeline is from the day that the motion is filed until the order is entered, and um, a copy of the motion is then sent to the respondent with a letter instructing the respondent that they need to file a response within 10 days. When the response is submitted, they can <clears throat> it can be placed on the docket and then submitted to the appropriate jurisdictional attorney so they can do the research analysis and analysis on the matter. Um, after a few days, the jurisdictional attorneys will submit a proposed order to a panel of judges and the instructions um, for a docket entry to show the submission to the panel. And so the case manager can schedule, <clears throat> they can schedule that order due within that 30-day time frame um, you know, so nobody misses any deadlines. Mm -hmm. The case is then submitted to the panel, and they give the okay to enter the order terminating the case, either granting or denying the movement's motion for permission to file a second or successive 2254 or 2255. A copy of the order is then sent to all parties, including the district court clerk and the district court judge, and the files inact are made inactive and sent downstairs to the file room. Um, and all these orders are not subject to petitions for rehearing or um, a writ of cert. Thanks so much, Ardell. Um, I, there are two other push-to-talk courts that um, uh, have indicated they'd like to be uh, heard from. One is uh, uh, from the 11th Circuit, Wardell Lovelace. And um, uh, Wardell, you submitted an effective practice uh, dealing with uh, expediting cases. And uh, that has to do with, uh, with uh, whether or not transcripts are necessary. Um, if you'll just take one minute, uh, and just one minute if you can, to explain what that effective practice is and why it works for you. Okay, Bob, hi. Uh, hi. We had a recent rule change that made the, um, the appellant's brief is due 
from the time that the notice of appeal is filed, as opposed to in the past we had to wait until we got a certificate of readiness from the district court. Our problem, what we wanted to do is be able to identify cases where transcripts were not likely to be ordered because we still had to wait for our transcript order form to be filed. However, if no transcript was ordered when the file was formed, then the brief, again, the briefing, the brief became due. Uh, the due date ran from the date that the notice of appeal was filed. So we figured um, when the case is open, the supervisor could just review the docket entries. And if, say, the only hearing that was held was something that was held at the beginning of the proceedings, and it's not, not an order or not a hearing that affected the final order that was being appealed, we just had the supervisor simply call the attorney who filed the notice of appeal, find out whether, in fact, he had any plans on ordering the transcript. And if he was going to order it, then we made the notation and waited for the transcript order form. However, if he indicated that he wasn't going to order any transcript, then we would identify the case as being an early briefing case and issue a briefing schedule right away. So how much time, then, are you saving by doing that? It must be a good, I think you had mentioned 14 days. Wardell, are you there? Uh, we're saving an average of about 60 days off our oh, media days. processing appeal <laughs> from the time that uh, the notice was filed to the time the last brief is filed. That's a great effective practice. Um, also on the line from uh, the D.C. Circuit is uh, Mary Ann McMain. And, and, um, uh, Marianne, you talked a little bit about um, dealing with uh, multi-district transfers, and uh, ex uh, explain a little bit about the challenge that you face. Hi, Bob. Hi. Are we reverbing? No, you're oh, doing can't fine. Hear you. Okay, great. <laughs> oh, now you're reverbing. <laughs> we uh, receive cases, and we also transfer out cases at the direction of the Judicial Panel on Multi-District Litigation. What we find is a challenge is finding out exactly who is transferring into us because sometimes we don't get complete dockets or we don't get complete clerk's files. So I wanted to share sort of what we do. Um, we issue an order that goes along with the direction of the multi-district litigation panel order transferring the case to the receiver court. We also make sure that we run a copy of our docket we try to make sure that the parties are as complete as possible with accompanying uh, counsel. Uh, we verify that the contents of the clerk's file match the contents of the docket sheet. Uh, we transfer the entire clerk's file, except with the uh, transfer order, to the receiving court. And um, we also send that by certified mail, so we do have a record of original documents being sent out there. We also try to, to take care of any uh, procedural motions that may be pending, especially motions to intervene, because I believe in the federal uh, rules it requires that motions to intervene or movements to intervene have to do so within 30 days of the docketing of the case. So if they get transferred out past that time and their motion to uh, intervene is dismissed as moot, then they're more or less sort of out of the case unless they can come back in and show cause why they should be a part of the case. Thank you so much, Mary Ann. We have about uh, two or three more minutes before this final segment uh, is concluded. Um, let me throw it open again to any push-to-talk courts out there that might want to, uh, to talk about uh, the issues covered or related issues here in terms of appellate case opening. Is there, uh, are there any push-to-talk courts that would like to uh, say a few words? Bob, this is Sharon at the 11th Circuit. Yes, hi again, Sharon. We'd like to share uh, something that we do with successive habeas applications. Our staff attorney's office devised a form that's very concise that we've made available to all the institutions in our circuit. When it's submitted by the petitioner, we simply send it over to the staff attorney. They prepare a memo a draft order for a court, turnaround time for them is about seven days. We submit it to the court, we get an order. We normally meet our 30-day deadline within 21 days. It's a very simple procedure and works very well for us. Oh, that sounds, that sounds They're wonderful. They're very easy to identify by our supervisor. Okay. Thank you so much again, Sharon, for coming on, on again. Um, with that, I want to thank our two panelists, Frank P uh, Perez and also Susan Gelmis. And uh, I'm just going to now, uh, if you don't mind, do just a few closing uh, remarks. And uh, uh, today we've uh, had an opportunity to take a look at appellate case opening as a process. 
uh, but also uh, looking at it from the point of view of what challenges that the court staff face. And I think, as you've heard, uh, you've gotten to, uh, to know a little bit about also some of the effective practices that they've developed in order to meet those challenges. Uh, we here at the Center hope that you found this broadcast to be informative and certainly directly related to, uh, to what you do on the job. Uh, uh, before closing, I'd uh, want to make you aware that we do have an evaluation form, and that too is found on, at the FJC website on the DCN uh, at jnet.fjc.dcn. We would very much appreciate hearing from you your thoughts on, on this broadcast. Uh, before closing, I again want to thank our panelists, uh, Mary Beth Kenny, Betsy Shoemaker, Frank Perez, and Susan Gelmas. Uh, also, our planning committee. Uh, you're going to see their names in the credits when this broadcast is over. But uh, I want to thank them for uh, the, uh, the excellent advice that uh, they gave us in helping us shape the discussion of this broadcast. Uh, I would say thanks to all the Push to Talk uh, sites that uh, became such active participants in this, in this program. That sharing of information is such an important part of the, uh, the learning process. And, and finally, uh, to two folks at the center, Zanita Burkett for all the wonderful logistics work that she did, and to Marianne Luckett for transcribing some of the, uh, uh, the conference calls that we have. Uh, I'd like to leave you then with a quote from Justice Souter that uh, I think says it all. Whatever court we're in, whatever we are doing, at the end of our task, some human being is going to be affected. Some human life is going to be changed in some way by what we do. We had better use every power of our minds and our hearts and our beings to get this right. Thank you for joining us today, and we'll see you on our next broadcast.